Hello, Government and Economics. Before we move on and finish up uh, 6B, I want to make one quick announcement. I was looking at some of the section review questions for 6A, got those grades in for you, and most of you did really well. You got all the questions right for the most part, but I did notice a lot of you are not writing full sentence responses. So for example, question one said something like, what was the predominant economic system from 1500 to 1700? And Basically, all of you correctly responded with mercantilism, um, but you need to be writing a full sentence. So you should say something like, the predominant economic system from 1500 to 1700 was mercantilism. At least something close to that effect, okay? So I'll be checking. You got full credit, even if it wasn't a complete sentence. But for this section review, I'm going to be looking at that. Please make sure that you're writing in full sentences, uh, good punctuation, good grammar, formally. No personal language, no I, me, we, any of that, okay? Uh, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and move in. If you remember from last week, before we actually discuss forms of capitalism itself, let's kind of go back and remember all of these types of uh, economies, right, exist on a spectrum rather than just a binary. Okay, so there's not just capitalism or socialism, so to speak. There's wiggle room or variation within capitalism and socialism, and it becomes a scale, right? Like a sliding scale. So you can be more or less capitalist. It's not just an in or out category per se. So we're going to really define what we mean by that. We're going to go over these forms of capitalism, which are all these things more on the blue side over here. Okay, so this includes things like state capitalism, classic capitalism, and radical capitalism. Now, radical capitalism, if you remember from last lesson, technically doesn't exist. It's purely theoretical. But in this theoretical world, private citizens like you and me would own all the means of production and make all the decisions. It would be completely and totally up to individuals like us. And if that was the case, there's not a real government, right? Because we are making literally all of the decisions. Because of that, there's no real regulation or interference with industry or business at all. So, you know, again, it's theoretical, but a society like this would probably be hyper productive with what it can produce. Uh, but there's a lot of good historical examples you could point to to say, well, you know, some government is necessary. It's not like businesses themselves are inherently trustworthy by merit of being a business, right? Um, individuals are just as corrupt as governments because governments are made of individuals, right? So uh, moving on, we have classic liberal capitalism, okay? This is Adam Smith's brainchild, okay? This is what he thought of when he discussed capitalism. And really, he thought there's three main functions for a government. Please make sure you know these three main things. Number one, it protects citizens from aggression, okay? The government exists to make sure that you don't get hurt, that you don't get murdered, Okay. Two, infringement from others, which could mean something like protecting your property. Um, so both your life and your property are protected here, right? And then to provide public goods. This meant that the government probably would tax, uh, would own a degree maybe of industry, right? Uh, but it's limited, right? So public goods are things like parks, uh, public transport, right? So government would provide those things, but it wouldn't be the main provider of goods for the nation. That would still mostly be done by, by merchants or business owners like us individuals. Then you get something called state capitalism, Ooh, which I'm kind of obscuring there. Um, state capitalism is probably closer to what we actually have in the United States today. Private citizens do own most of the resources, the capital, the labor, right? Business is booming in the US, so to speak. Uh, right now. There's tons of businesses doing all types of crazy things. Uh, businesses are alive and well. However, the government does interfere in decision making to reach certain goals. A good example of this is actually what's going on right now with coronavirus. You'll notice there's a lot of businesses that are reorienting themselves to produce things they might not uh, normally produce. For example, Tesla Motors right now, if I recall collect correctly, is going to start making ventilators for hospitals. Now, this is because of government encouragement. It's not like Tesla is being 
obligated to do this thing, right? The, the, gov the business would still have the freedom to say, no, we are not going to devote our time, energy, and resources toward that thing. But the government can play a role in determining what businesses are doing to some extent. Still limited, right? It's not total control. It's far from it. But they do get involved, okay? To a fair degree. Um, extreme versions of this would result in something like a welfare state. Well, yes, people are still running businesses and stuff, but people become almost reliant on the government for most of their actual um, consumer needs, okay? This is not the case in America. Um, some people think we're going that way. Some people think that's far off and we're being, you know, alarmist. But it's fair to say that America is probably hovering around this region of state capitalism. So let's go back real quick. Just look at that, that graph, right? You'll notice that's toward the middle, right? That's where the blue starts to become sort of a pinkish hue. Okay. Some people would say we're closer to social democracy, which we'll get to later. Some people say, no, we're still closer to classic capitalism. Either way, we're hovering somewhere around state capitalism. So going back, um, let's talk about some forms of socialism, right? Social democracy, okay, this is the one right after state capitalism. So if we're going from the blue into the pink, this is the next step. And this one, the key industries of the nation, like energy, manufacturing, what you might consider like the most important, the essential things, are actually owned and operated and run by the government. When you do this on a really large scale, what you're doing is you're nationalizing something. So if you take a look at England, right? England is probably more socialist than America, even though they're both capitalist countries, right? Because England's not nationalized when it comes to all industries, but they do have something called the NHS, which is the national healthcare system, right? That's a nationalized uh, healthcare system. Sometimes we hear the term socialized medicine, right? Canada does this as well. This is when the federal government actually runs and operates or owns the healthcare industries. Now in America, there's a mixture, right? We, we have had attempts to move towards something that's socialized like Obamacare, right? Something that is nationalized. And then there's people that resist that and say, no, we want to keep it privatized, which would be an effort to resist nationalization and stay away from something like a social democracy. And in this world, um, small businesses are heavily regulated. The, the government's just sort of keeping tabs on them in a way they might not in some of the more distinct forms of capitalism. For centralized socialism, now we're, now we're getting to the point where the government actually has a, a lot of control. Okay, this is Karl Marx's vision. He wrote the Communist Manifesto, obviously, but he understood, if you read the Communist Manifesto, that socialism was sort of the road that you had to travel before you could arrive at communism. So at this point, the state really owns all industries and production, okay? There's not, there really is no kind of private ownership of businesses or property, okay? Almost at all. So this is really what happens when you have elites or government planners or politicians or some sort of ruling or governing authority that is deciding what will be made, how much will be made, who's going to get it. The government is answering all the economic questions and you as a citizen are just sort of going along with it. Okay. You might play a role that's probably assigned to you at the job or factory or farm that you work at, but these things aren't up to you. You're not going to start your own business in a centralized socialist country. So countries like this today are actually uh, China, North Korea, Venezuela's moving this way. Uh, typically it doesn't end well. And then you actually have full-blown communism, which just like radical capitalism, is technically also purely theoretical. Socialism, this is what Karl Marx said, and this is what I was referring to earlier, is the long, hard struggle between capitalism and communism. Okay, so he saw socialism as this thing we had to get through before communism could be reached or achieved. Um, the ultimate goal of communism is that the means of production are shared by the workers. The, the workers themselves seize and own the means of production corporately or communally. And in that way, just like when we talked about the radical capitalism, there's no real government. Once you get to pure communism, there's also no government anymore because no one owns anything. It's just sort of like when everybody becomes the state, there is no more state. Um, if that's difficult to conceptualize, that's okay. It's never happened. So just like radical capitalism would also be hard to conceptualize.
Uh, so let's do a little quick contrast before we wrap up the lesson, okay? Pros and cons of both systems. Remember how I said you cannot criticize what you do not understand? Okay, we're going to try to give a fair view to both of these things, okay? Benefits of capitalism is if you look at all capitalist countries, on average, people have a higher standard of living in terms of their material possessions and their wealth, the things that they own in that regard. There's also a lot of economic and personal freedom in that regard. So they have the freedom to buy and sell goods freely. Whereas with socialism, that might not be true, but you have really low unemployment rates. We've talked about this. Um, work is very important in socialist countries. Everybody needs to be working, right? So um, everybody's going to be assigned a duty or job in some regard. There's also this really strong emphasis on fair treatment of workers and division of labor. So you'll notice, like, if you, if you look at socialist factories, right, um, or factories in socialist countries, okay, um, things are very systematized. You're going to have one person and they do one job and just that job generally. And division of labor is generally very helpful for actual productivity or output in that factory. Um, and there's a big emphasis ever going all the way back to Karl Marx about like, you know, this being for the workers. It doesn't always work out that way historically, but that is at least what it is uh, on paper. Uh, moving on. Some problems with capitalism, exploitation of workers, and unequal labor division. Okay, you might try to get some person to do four people's jobs because you can, and then when that happens, you're exploiting the worker. You're trying to get more out of them, and maybe you're not paying them what they're worth, right? This is a problem that Karl Marx actually rightfully noted, okay? Um, you can disagree with his solution to the problem, but that's actually a valid criticism of capitalism. Um, there's also a higher degree of unemployment. Now, granted, a lot of this is because people have the freedom to move jobs, to not have a job if they want to, right? No one's being obligated to work like a socialist country. But this means people aren't working and people should be working, generally speaking, so still something to consider. Problems with socialism, um, little to no economic freedom. You are not going to, you know, go down to the uh, automotive manufacturer and pick out the car you want with the rims you want and the color you want with the interior you like and drive off the lot, right? You're going to have big, important goods like that when it comes to transport, sometimes even food prescribed for you, okay? When Russia um, became Soviet Russia, they even went around the country and cookbooks were being instituted across the country so that everybody was kind of eating the same standardized food, right? So your choices on what to eat were even limited. If you want another extreme example, you can go to North Korea, Right? Where when you go to get your hair cut as a North Korean citizen, there's like a list of approved hairstyles to choose from. Okay, so you, when I mean you have little or no economic freedom, I mean like little or no economic freedom. There's also, generally speaking, a lower standard of living. Um, just take a look historically at what has you know, happened to citizens who are living in communist countries that are very communist, and it doesn't look good. Um, there's oftentimes trouble just having people get fed, so get fed enough. That is basically everything for this lesson, though. We only have one more thing to go over. I'm just going to give you a couple scriptural references to sort of evaluate when you are trying to understand, well, you know, what, what should I value more? Something like unemployment, standard of living, you know, it can get kind of confusing, and rather than just use your own personal opinion, we want to use scripture as a guide. So, I don't expect you to like memorize all these verses or something, okay? I'm not just trying to shoehorn Bible lessons or Bible verses into the lesson, um, but I want you to be aware of some of this. So there's lots of verses that speak to private property and why there's ownership of it, okay? Um, for your quiz coming up, try to have at least one of these for each main concept in your back pocket, okay? Or take notes and try to, you know, keep one at hand. So have one for private property, one for individual responsibility. Okay, we have like the parable of the talents that kind of verifies both of these. God entrusts things to you that are your property, and then you are responsible for taking care of them as a good steward. Okay, those are some things that might uh, support beliefs that typically we would associate with capitalism. But on the other hand, there's plenty in there that people that are socialist would say is also important that the Bible does affirm fair treatment of workers. Um, Workers are supposed to be paid fairly and honestly, and they should know what they're getting paid. This is very clear in Scripture, so there's a selection of verses for you to look at there. And then also, the Scriptures, time and time again, 
uh, warning us about the danger of becoming too attached to material things, right? And so people often associate capitalism with greed. And even if that's not a fair association, you'll, you know, if you're being honest, um, you'll notice that if you go to capitalist countries, the degree to which people accumulate wealth and material possessions is much higher. That's largely because you can't do that in a socialist country, given the poverty that often exists. But that doesn't make the, the hoarding that exists in capitalist countries really any better. Okay, so just some things to be aware of. And that concludes our lesson for today. So make sure that you complete the knowledge check right after this and the Section 6B review for homework. Have an awesome day.